Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to give two definitions of group. So the first definition is the more standard one which you will see in, in your textbooks, most likely. And I'll call it the textbook definition. That's the one in red up here. It says that a group is a set, G, with a binary operation star, which means star is an operation which takes two inputs from the group and gives an output. Is this here? Okay. So how is this written? Well, when we usually write functions, we write f of x comma y, but this, the notation we'll use for this is the infix notation. So star of x comma y will be written how? How will it be written? Excuse me? Yeah. How will you write star of x and y? What's the, what, how will you write it? You write it as x star y. Right? So you write the operator in between. Okay? Yeah? Yeah. So, so, so this is called infix notation. Okay? And it's just more convenient than writing like this. Okay? So this, this is less convenient. This is more convenient. Okay. Now, now a group is a set with a binary operation which satisfies three conditions. Okay? So if all the conditions are satisfied, it's called a group. So what's the first condition? Hmm? It's written there. Associativity. What does it say? Well, I... S well, I'll use A, B, C. So... A star B star C equals to A star B star C. This is a star, that blob. Maybe it's not very clear. But this is a group operation. So A star B star C. And for what A, B, C does it hold? Into. For all A, B, C, right? It's universal. That's what associated with it. Now, when I write for all A, B, C, and G, do I allow A, B, and C to be equal? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I could have two of them equal and the third different, or I could have all of them equal, or I could have all of them different, or whatever. Okay. Now, the next condition is identity element. So, what does that say? There exists an element E in G, which will be called an identity element such that what? Uh, e star A equals to E. Well, you, e want, you want both. A both. star E. Yeah, okay. So I'll write A star E equals E star A equals E. Sorry, equals A. a. For, for what? For all A and G. For all A and G. Okay. And what is the inverse element condition say? For every A, there is an element B, which I'll be thinking of as the inverse of A, such that something holds. Now, this actually depends on the identity element. So, what's really happening here first, finding an identity element, and then the inverse axiom is really relative to that identity which you pick. So, what does it say? A star B equals to B star A equals to E. And I don't have to put any more for all, because the for all already came here. Okay? Okay, good. And this E is, is the identity element above. Okay, so it's uh, E is an identity element. Now, actually, it will turn out that the identity element is unique. So there isn't any question of which identity element we are picking when we are trying to decide what it means to be an inverse element, but we don't know that a priori. Okay, and B is sometimes denoted A to the minus 1 like this, and it's read as A inverse. Is this here? Yes. Okay, good. So there's another axiom which is considered part of the definition of group, which I'm not writing here, and that's closure. What does closure say? A star B is in G, A both in A and G. Yes, it's, it, it's basically just saying that the binary operation is well defined. Okay, and so I'm not including closure because the way I define binary operation, closure is already part of the definition of binary operations. When I said binary operation, that's already included. Okay, so closure is true, but uh, but it's implicit. I just write that here in case you miss my words. So closure, which is A star B is in G for all A, B, and G. Is this true? Yes is part of the definition of binary operation. So I'm not including it separately. Okay. 
So now one more thing I want to say before we go on. That is that, so if I just give you a set and I ask you, is this set a group? Does my question make sense? No. Why not? You need to give a, you need to give a binary output. Yes. So in order to ask the question whether a set is a group, I need to specify the set and the binary operation. So the group structure, the group structure includes both the set and the binary operation. Includes both the set and the binary operation. Okay, what that means is if I have the same set and I give two different binary operations, those could be two different groups. Okay, now if I give you a set and a binary operation, does that become a group? Hmm? No. no, you still have to check the conditions. If the conditions are satisfied, then it's a group. If they're not satisfied, then it's not a group. Okay, good. But without the binary operation, it doesn't even make sense to ask the question. Okay, now I'll go to another definition. And before I go to this definition, I want to say quickly why it's important. Well, in the earlier definition, we just defined one operation, which is this binary operation, the multiplication. Now what I want to do is I want to define new operations which capture these two things, the identity element and the inverses. So I've postulated their existence, but now I want to include these also in the group structure. So, so... I now define a group as a set with three operations. The binary operation, which is just a multiplication, the same one as before. Okay. Now, by the way, when I say multiplication, I'm talking of the operation in the group, but it need not be anything to do with multiplication of real numbers or anything. Right? It, it's just some binary operation. So, in this new definition, there's this binary operation. There's a zero array operation, which is trying to do what? What? What's What's the zero array operation? I don't know. Well, we want to capture the identity and the inverses. So the identity is just a constant element, right? Mm -hmm. So to capture a constant element is the same as specifying a zero array operation. Now, what does that mean? So what does binary operation mean? Two inputs, one output, right? Right? Mm -hmm. That's because the binary count, there's a two there, right? It's a two array operation, two inputs, one output. What should zero array operation mean? How many inputs, how many outputs? Well, there should be one output, but how many inputs does a zero array operation have? Zero. Zero. Which means it doesn't take any inputs, but still gives an output, right? That's the same as saying it gives a constant element, right? It just gives a, gives a element of the group. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's what the zero array operation is doing. And the idea is that this element will be the identity element. We haven't yet specified the condition that we'll come to later, but the goal is to encode the identity element as a zero array operation. Okay? So zero array operation is just the same as picking a constant. You get that? And we are trying to pick a zero array operation that picks out the identity element. And what's the inverse thing? So what's the unary operation going to be? What's the go what's this unary operation trying to do? Take one input and give one output. Yeah, and what what which of these things is it trying to model? What's left? The inverse. The inverse. So the unary operation is denoted like this. And it's denoted by it's called the inverse map and it's denoted by x superscript minus one. And it's denoted. So the in image of x is denoted x superscript minus one. Okay, like that. Okay. Now, what are the conditions that these operations need to satisfy? Associativity. What will that say? Same thing.
when I write it like this, do I allow them to be equal? Yes. Okay. Uh, identity element. Oh, but the identity elements are also called neutral elements. What does this say? Well, it should be the same as the thing above, right? We are trying to define the same thing. So, what's the difference now between here and here? Well, earlier, the E had to be, you had to say there exists E and G, right? But now the E is already known to us. It's already part of the group structure. So, what do you say? You just say the second line. So, what do you say? Hmm? A star. E equals E star A. Well, what does it to do with zero operation? Sorry? Well, what's, why do you have to define a zero zero? Well, zero array operation is just a fancy way of saying we picked a constant element. Well, well, I think it's more intuitive to just say there is a zero element. There, there is an identity element. Mm -hmm. You think this one, or the earlier definition is more intuitive? Yeah? Yeah. Well, that's why that's the one that's taught to beginners, right? Uh, it's, yeah. But I'll tell you why this one is, well, not, I cannot explain why this definition is better in some respects fully, but I'll give a hint. And the inverse elements, what does that say? Well, the same thing, the second line. The second line here, but now I don't write B. I just use the operation, right? So I'll say, what does it say? Hmm? A star A inverse. A inverse star A. For all A and G. Okay, good. Now, in, with this definition, what does the group structure include? So, recall, with the earlier definition, the group structure included the set and the binary operation, right? So, I have to specify a set and a binary operation. In the new structure, on the other hand, I have to specify four things to describe a group. What four things do I need to specify? A set and a three operation. Set, the binary operation the zero array operation and the unary operation to the inverse map. And then, what do I have to check? I have to check these three conditions. Right, so in this new definition, there seems to be more structure. Right, there are, there is more I need to specify to describe a group. Now, if I want to show that these definitions are equivalent, what would I need to show? So, the earlier thing, this was with the old definition. With the new definition, set, binary operation, identity, and inverse, right? All four things. So to show they are equivalent, what would I need to do? Well, I'd need to show that somehow this additional information is redundant, right? It doesn't really give any new information. So the, the equivalence of definitions would basically mean that that the identity and the inverse here mm -hmm. hmm, are already determined by the binary operation. So if I just specify the set and the binary operation, which is enough in the old definition, then the identity and the inverse are, are determined. They are uniquely determined by the binary operation. Right? If I show that, then I would have shown that just specifying the set and the binary operation is equivalent to specifying the set and all three operations. Okay? Hmm? Now, next question is why, why did I give the second definition? Right? What's the point of the second definition when the first one looks simple? Right? The advantage of the second definition is that, that the conditions are now really simple. Right? If, if I've already specified all these four things, then then, uh, then it's, you just have to check these conditions and all these conditions, all the quantifiers are for all. Okay. So there is no, there exists something here in this part of the definition. Whereas in the earlier definition, there were there exists here, there exists B here. But in the new definition, all the conditions are quantified with for all. And that, that, that may not seem significant, but it's actually quite significant for a lot of things. Okay? So, 
So these are the definitions. Now we'll see in future videos exactly why the definitions are equivalent. We'll prove that the binary operation determines the identity and the inputs.